Shalom, everyone. My name is Tony Pino, and welcome to another another episode of A Jew and Gentile Discuss. This is episode number 51, and I am here with my good friend, uh, Brother Mitch Chapman. As usual, we are coming at you to give you uh, a perspective on how to follow the Torah. We are trying to bring a balanced view to you all to show you that within the covenants that you are now a part of, whether you are an Israelite or whether you are a Gentile, you are part of the kingdom of Israel. You are part of her covenants. And what does that mean? Because the greatest calling that Yeshua gave to all of his disciples is to go make disciples. And that's our goal here today is to help teach and help bring uh, discipleship along in your lives. And what we have been doing is we've been viewing uh, some videos by a gentleman named R.L. Solberg, who runs a YouTube channel called Defending the Biblical Roots of Christianity. And he is trying to push back on the idea of the true biblical uh, interpretation that we are to follow Torah as believers in Yeshua, we are in one kingdom. There's one faith, one spirit, one baptism. Amen. And it is all uh, one body of Messiah. So there's one kingdom, one set of laws, and uh, we are to glorify the king in our lives. We are to conform to his image. So that is what we're doing. But Solberg is tr trying to push back on the idea. Now, last time together, we were talking about his video on Sabbath. So that's where we're going to pick up. We're going to continue there. He's trying to push back on the idea that the Sabbath is still for all believers today. He'll often say, well, it's permitted, you know, but not required. And he's really, in my eyes, messing with the covenant. Uh, he is playing around with mm -hmm. covenant and showing that he doesn't understand how covenants operate. But uh, I'm going to go ahead and bring Brother Mitch in here. How you doing, Brother Mitch? Any thoughts? Yeah, I'm doing, doing well, Tony, and uh, good to be back uh, again after a week's absence. Um, we, we kind of, um, you know, we miss things. <laughs> yeah, exactly. When, when we don't uh, do it on a regular weekly basis. But life happens, so we adjust accordingly. Amen. Amen. We are also, everyone, just so you know, we're heading towards Hanukkah. Hanukkah here is, uh, you know, less than two weeks out. Uh, so maybe in a, a week or two, we'll talk a little bit about Hanukkah also. Uh, 11 more days. That's it. It is coming fast. It'll be on uh, December 18th, right? If I'm not sundown. mistaken. Yep. Yeah. December 18th, that's not sundown. Right. Amen. So we are not going to waste a whole lot of time. Let's go ahead and just jump in. This is part two. All right. So episode 50, if you guys are following along, we began, we got into about maybe 11 minutes or so of his video. This is the one thing about Solberg's videos is, uh, you know, for me, he goes off track so quickly that, you know, it does, it does take us stopping to, uh, because otherwise too much of a gap goes in there and he's way off in left field somewhere. And, uh, uh, because, you know, as we always say, air begets air begets air. So again, everyone, we are trying to attack the arguments. We're trying to show you and do pushback on the arguments, not the man. Um, we do hold that he's a very smart guy. Um, but he has, I believe fallen into the, the trap of just, you know, biblical college, theological seminary, you know, way of moving through, which uh, gets you into a specific structure and how you are to see the scriptures, uh, which isn't always correct in our eyes. So, um, so he's just following the normal pattern. That's why we've chose him to uh, present everything to you guys today. Amen. All right, let's go ahead and jump into it. What's so that? What, what Solberg is, uh, does basically is he gets away from the bases and the basics of hermeneutics, which is exegesis. Oh, you went on uh, mute there. He, 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 someone's trying to call. Uh, ah, okay. <laughs> yeah. And so he uses, he doesn't use exegesis, which is pulling out of scripture. What he's using is uh, what's called eisegesis, which is putting your own thoughts into scripture. That's not 
how scripture is to be interpreted. Now, there is a place of eisegesis which comes with application. However, how can you apply something if you don't understand what the meaning is? I don't know. It's very difficult to do. However, within the broad, uh, uh, I'll just say in the church, and that, that's a, a broad statement, but in the church, there's always a rush to make application without understanding what a scripture actually is teaching, what the context of the scripture is. And that's why uh, even many times myself, as we minister to somebody, we have you and I, Tony, we, we, you know, we have memorized a lot of scripture so we can off the top of our heads provide someone with a scripture. And what we're attempting to do is just to deal with that particular issue that they have. That's okay. But when you're teaching, you can't do that. Mm -hmm. Although people do it. Now, as an example, there's a, a gentleman in Nigeria that you have come to know. Mm -hmm. And uh, he is going through uh, theological training in his denomination. Uh, recently, he uh, sent me a, a notice, and this goes to you as well, Tony, that his whole eyes have been opened up because he it was being fit into this narrow box, which you refer to, which, all, which happens no matter where you go to school. This is what we teach. This is how you are to learn it. Mm -hmm. If you don't learn it our way and we're going to give you a test to prove that you have learned it our way, you're going to flunk and you won't pass. Right. Okay. So that's the system. It's systematic. Many times the system is broken because it's devoid of the foundation of biblical faith, which is Torah. Right. You can't get away from torah you really can, you can attempt to but it will come back and it will bite you and it will bite you pretty hard so this gentleman in nigeria uh was thankful that we spent time with him to get him you know slap him around nicely from afar on, on facebook or or through whatsapp and uh, get him back to Wait a second. What's the context? What's mm -hmm. the context? What's right. the context? Uh, excuse me, but what's the context? Oh, you mean you want me to find out what the context is? How can you, as a theological student, where you're being trained to become a pastor of some sort, and you're going to be preaching, how can you preach or teach if you don't know what the context is? You're just going to make it up as you go? Come on. Right. And not only that, but don't be afraid to raise your hand or challenge someone that is coming out of context and say, where did you get that from? What is like, well, wait a second. What's the context? Don't be afraid just because they have a position or they have a title. So if you read scripture for scripture and take the plain literal meaning of scripture unless elsewhere something will uh, come up that indicates that it's not to be taken literally then take it literally right i mean it, it's really very simple but we make things up we don't we take you know we we like to go uh, cherry picking out of cherry season which seems to be all of the time even when uh, cherries are in season, people don't like to pick cherries the right way. Right. And, and, and here it becomes more problems. I, th I think, too, uh, Brother Mitch, and you could probably attest to this because you've seen this more than I have. But even students coming out of yeshiva school, right? Yeshiva schools have a specific way they want a lens, a box they want you to attack the the scriptures uh through the talmudic writings through the authority of the rabbis and so forth 
it can even get that way. So we're not just picking on Western Christianity, but we know any schooling, biblical schooling can have that weakness where they do that to their students. Uh, not to say that all schooling is bad. We're not saying that. There's a, there's a lot of great things you learn in a lot of these places, but you need to be aware when you're getting uh, instructions that is actually not looking at the context, but looking at the the Bible through this other lens, right? Or am I? Yeah, no, ab- you're absolutely right, Tony. And uh, two points on that. Number one is that for my ethnic Jewish cousins, uh, predominantly of the Orthodox bent, um, they're going, they're taught to, uh, what did Rashi say? Okay, so right, right. it's always let's go to the commentary, and his commentary in Talmud is different than his commentary on Tanakh, because the commentary in Talmud on Isaiah fifty three is this is Messiah, but yet the commentary in Tanakh he changes his mind, and he says no, that's Israel, and now so now you have all of the post modern and this there. The issue comes in. So that that's one broad statement there. The other side, personally as well, I remember years ago uh, when I was leading the Jewish ministry at Calvary Chapel, Fort Lauderdale, and I, you know, I just decided to take some classes at the Biblical Institute. And I remember sitting down the very first day in an auditorium for people who were thinking about doing it, who really wanted to or had already paid, um, you know, a deposit or something like that. Uh, One of the pastors uh, stood up and said, this is Calvary Chapel Bible Institute. This is not fill in the blank Bible Institute. This is Calvary Chapel Bible Institute. So what were we going to get? We were going to get the Calvary Chapel teaching of right. the Bible in the Calvary Chapel Institute. It's the same thing. Yep. Okay. Uh, those that come, regardless of your background, that go out to Dallas Theological Seminary, DTS for short, you're going to come out with dispensation theology, as you will with overwhelmingly all of the seminaries today. Mm -hmm. Southern Baptist seminaries, there's five or six of them scattered all over the country. Dispensation theology. Right. Okay. And so it's problematic. You just got to go in knowing the weakness and the strengths of each facility, of each program. Right. That's, Mm -hmm. you know, um, but yeah. The one one of the things that I do when when somebody uh, is looking to uh, join one of the uh, numerous Facebook groups that we are a uh, administrator or moderator in, uh, and I find out that they have some type of theological background, either they have a degree or they tell me that they went to so and so, you know, Bible college. I always ask them my favorite question. And, and that is, so um, what is the covenant they broke referred to by Jeremiah in 31, 32? And it's amazing to me that, well, it's really not amazing. Well, yeah, in one side it is, the other side it isn't. So uh, 99, 44% of the time, nobody gets it right, which means 99 and 44% of the time, they all get it wrong. <laughs> so what is the covenant that they broke in Jeremiah 31, 32? It says it if you read it for yourself. Yeah. And of course, it depends upon what English version of the Bible you're reading. So, you know, you have a little play in there as well. So just to answer the question, if you're thinking, what is he talking about? There he goes again. It's the marriage covenant which ties into what we're going to be talking about today, Shabbat, because Shabbat is the sign of the covenant. What happened at Sinai? Marriage. What's the sign of a covenant? Ring finger. Right. 
So last time we left off, everyone, uh, Solberg was really trying to press the issue that there was no real seven-day pattern established at creation, um, and uh, that the seventh day was not set aside as holy at creation. He tries to make some type of argument for it became a period of time, and, you know, He's trying to argue from silence, saying, well, no instructions were given to work six and take off a day. Um, so he, again, working from silence uh, on that, which is not uh, a really good argument. Um, and we'll talk more about that when we get into the video. Let's go ahead and dive in. Yeah. Exodus 31. Therefore, the people of Israel shall keep the Sabbath, observing it throughout their Yep. Got it on uh, double speed here. Hold on one second. Okay. <laughs> That's how I listen to a lot of my videos. Uh, I listen to them a lot on double speed. And let me turn up his volume here. Um, yeah, I've just kind of trained my ears that way. Uh, it's become pretty helpful. Let me see here. Make sure all my volume. Uh, yep, they're all up. Okay, we are getting there. All right, got to back it up because we left off right about, oops, right about the 11 uh, minute mark here. There we go. Perfect. All right. As a weekly Shabbat. Now, the second problem with the idea that Shabbat began at creation is that there is no biblical evidence that the Sabbath was ever kept by anyone prior to God giving it to Israel in the wilderness. There's no mention of it before that. Now, when the Shabbat is finally given, thousands of years later, after God rescued Israel out of slavery in Egypt, it's linked to the seventh day of creation. It was at that point, as Israel wandered in the wilderness and, and God began providing them with manna, that God gave the weekly Shabbat to Israel. And creation week was the model on which the rhythm of Shabbat was based, not the other way around. The weekly Sabbath wasn't the basis for creation week. Jesus said, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. I can't, I can't believe he's saying all this. Wouldn't, wouldn't Yahweh be giving it to Israel because it's been disobeyed? We can make that argument. It's been disobeyed for so long. It's been forgotten. It's been the pattern. It started out as seven-day pattern, and uh, mankind just began to ignore it and uh, stop doing it. And so he has now uh, brought forth his people, forging a nation, and he's giving it back to them. It was always there from the beginning. I mean, he just said, Yeshua said it was made for mankind. There you go. Mankind. When was mankind created? At the beginning. Well, uh, so he, one of uh, what I'm finding uh, with uh, our dear brother, Rob, who is off again, uh, sadly at that, is because he has some, um, I believe, philosophy degree. So he philosophizes a lot. Okay, That's where the eisegesis comes in. So he's reading things into scripture that aren't there based upon a 2022 understanding, which comes from a position of Western church Christianity which is dispensationism, which is unknowingly, but it really is replacement theology and anti-Semitic because the church, although they won't come out and say it blatantly, in dispensation theology, you have to come away with the understanding that there's now two groups of people. There's the church and there's Israel. And you get into a whole bunch of this other stuff. Now, also, what I find really funny is that he's saying that there's no set period of time. So now we go back and let's go back to Genesis 1. And what was a day? So a day was a, a long period of time that nobody knew what it was. Come on, Rob. It says right there. Evening. 
and the next day. So we know that a day is 24 hours. So you're making another argument that doesn't exist. Where do you get this stuff from? That's that's the biggest thing. I, I like the way you said that, making an argument that doesn't exist. I mean, so, you know, uh, Genesis 2, so the heavens and the earth were completed along with their entire array. God completed it on the seventh day. What's the pattern of the other six? I mean, it's well, already there. He doesn't have to keep explaining it. That's right. And so anybody that knows a little bit about Scripture would tell you that the uh, Genesis 1 is the creation account. And how do we know? What do we know? Where do we know? Uh, where can we find it? Who, what, where, when, why, and how? All of those wonderful six questions that should be your biblical friends and always ask them of a particular scripture or context. In verse 5 of chapter 1 in Genesis, God called the light day and the darkness he called night so the evening dark and what and the morning were called what the first day here we have 24 hours it's right there okay now continuing with that thought so it ends in uh chapter one ends of course with verse 31 then God saw everything that he had made, and indeed it was very good, tov ma'od. So the evening and the morning were the sixth day. Chapter 2 does what? Chapter 2 gives a summary statement, as Torah most often does. There's a big dialogue, and then there's a short summary. Or there could be, in a different order, a short summary or little nuggets here, 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 and there like a jigsaw puzzle, putting them all together, a little piece here, a little piece there, etc., through the progressive revelation of Scripture. But here, jumping from Genesis 1 right into Genesis 2, you have the long account of creation, Genesis chapter 1, and now you have the summary in the very first four verses. The heavens and the earth and all of them were finished. Were finished when? Go back to 131. And they this was the sixth day. So it was finished on the sixth day. Now verse 2. And continuing with verse 1. When the heavens and the earth were finished. On the seventh day, God ended his work. Hello, and which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all of his work, which he had rested. Then what did he do? Verse three, God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it. He blessed it. He set it apart because in it, he rested from his work, which God cr had created and made. Now, let's jump ahead to where you and I, Tony, know that he will eventually get to, and that is, it's not a day, it's a person, that Yeshua is our rest. Well, is that really true? I don't think so, because Yeshua gave us rest. Yeshua didn't become the seventh day of rest, because there's a difference between the one day of week that is holy to be remembered, not forgotten, although many forget to remember right. <laughs> that it is to be holy and set apart, sanctified. Okay, so I'm going to read this. Uh, I sent you this email that I received. And uh, okay, so this is all about uh, must Gentile Christians observe the Jewish feast? Now, that's how the question is posed. So the, the question is, you know, there, there's problems with that. So the first assumption is that Christians are a member of a non-Jewish movement. <clears throat> okay. Independent in every way from the people of Israel. <clears throat> Why do I say that? 
yeah, I'm making fun, but why do I say that? Let's go to Ephesians chapter 2, and let's start looking at from verse 11 through 14. Now, everybody pretty much knows 2.8, 2.9, and 2.10, the holy trifecta. Of what you're saved by, what you're not saved by, and what you're saved for. And now, and then people forget, don't remember, hardly ever read, the rest of the chapter of Ephesians 2, which, Tony, if you can remember, one of the early videos that we did in this ongoing series of a Jew and Gentile discuss was, in fact, Ephesians chapter 2. So, I'm getting to it in my Bible here. So, therefore, remember that you once Gentiles in the flesh who were called uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision made in the flesh of hands that now who is he speaking to? He's speaking to those from the nations. He's speaking to his brothers and sisters of faith in Yeshua who were in verse 12 at that time which meant previous to their coming to faith in Yeshua. You were without Messiah. You were an alien. You were a stranger from the covenants, plural, of promise. You had no hope. You were without God. But more importantly, you were an alien from, listen carefully, from the commonwealth of Israel. When anyone, anyone comes to faith in the biblical Yeshua, we become part of the commonwealth of Israel. This is not the physical country Israel. This is the Israel of God. And as every country in the world would have, they have a ruling document. Here in the U.S., what do we call it? The Constitution of the United States of America. Okay? What is the Constitution of the, common, the biblical commonwealth of Israel? The Israel of God. What document would that be? It is the Torah. And he continues in verse 13. But now in Messiah Yeshua, Yeshua, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Messiah. And then he continues and goes on, uh, you know, one new man uh, drawn by the blood. And, and, you know, the middle wall is broken down. And all of that is good, but the heart is verse 12 you were previous to faith and this is everybody my ethnic jewish cousins and me personally i never got a do not go to jail card okay in monopoly pass go get 200 dollars. you don't go to jail right but you draw that jail card what happens you go to jail you go to directly to jail you do not pass go you do not get 200 dollars here, those anyone, although specifically in the context, he's now referring to those from the nations, Gentiles, and he says to them previously, you were Messiah-less, you were country-less, you were covenant-less, you were promise-less, you were hopeless, and you were godless. That's a lot of problems to overcome. But now, <laughs> I love those words. But now, in Messiah Yeshua, you Gentiles, before you came to faith, who were once far off. And now that refers to everybody. Because we were all once far off. And even though I was born a Jew, born into a Jewish family that goes all the way back to antiquity, that did not give me 
a a free pass. What I, everybody, me, myself included, all those that come after me and all those that came before me, we all have to make a personal decision as to who Yeshua really is and what does the Bible really teach. It's it's really simple as that. So he misses it. And he continues to go on and on and on with his theology, which is church-based theology, based upon a dispensation system of theology, which is only about maybe 180, let's say it's even maybe only 200 years old. Wow. What were those people thinking 200 years ago in 1820-something, uh, and they were probably going to Ephesians chapter 4 and saying, gee whiz, this is what Shaul is talking about, a new wind of doctrine. Yeah, I mean, for me, dispensationalism is, you know, um, basically kind of comes forth from uh, Luther uh, and the Reformation age. And what they were trying to do is reform not first century uh, teachings. They were re trying to reform the Catholic teachings. They were trying to reform the Catholic Church, which was entrenched in replacement theology. So you're moving, uh, you know, along and Luther believed in replacement theology. There's no doubt. But as you're trying to reform things, these later scholars that are going to eventually come out of that replacement theology thought are going to not come out of it all the way. They're going to create this dispensational style teaching so that they can hold on to a little bit of replacement theology. But not quite, you know, they're kind of got their toes in one side and their other toe in another side. It kind of seems like it to me. But, yeah, I think um, Sober constantly doesn't understand the fact that not only was a nation formed at Sinai, but a kingdom. And a kingdom always involves citizens that might not be of that exact ethnic background of the actual nation because it's become a kingdom now, which is inviting other people groups to come in and be citizens of the kingdom, which still means taking on one law, one set of kingdom, uh, covenantal, you know, being a part of the covenant, being grafted into the people, you know, not changing your ethnicity, but becoming part of the kingdom. That, that's it. Uh, you know, um, she was, I, I, you know, at, with, um, you know, thinking along lines like he has, I wonder at times um, what the thought process would have been having lived in a previous age when there were uh, kings and tyrants running around and they would conquer your land. You're going to now say, I'm not part of you? All right. You go right to the stake and get burnt or yeah. you get your head lopped off or, you know, uh, Something not pleasant for certain. Yeah. And please, those of you out there listening to this uh, teaching here, listening to this video, it's not just Solberg we're talking about. He represents a general kind of thought within thousands upon thousands of Christians, Bible teachers uh, within Western Christianity and so forth. So it's not um, just about, you know, what Solberg is thinking. He, he is thinking generally what a lot of people, the way a lot of them think. Um, he's following along the same pattern. That's all. It's, mm -hmm. you know, that's why we're saying we're not attacking the man. We're attacking the philosophy, the theory that he is running with um, because it's common uh, amongst uh, a lot of denominations there. All right, let's go ahead and get back to the video. Okay. And the Torah says, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work. You or your son or your daughter or your male servant or your female servant or your livestock or, or the sojourners who's within your gates. 
So that's the commandment. And then Yahweh explains why the pattern of resting every seventh day was chosen. For, so the reason for this pattern of resting every seventh day is because in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. So in the same way that God blessed the seventh day of creation and made it holy or set apart from all the other creation days, he also blessed the weekly Shabbat and made it holy or, or set apart from all the other days of the week. So again, the weekly Shabbat is linked to creation. It, its rhythm is based on how God created. And Shabbat would serve as a continual reminder to the Israelites that God supplies us with our every need. Right? Adam and Eve did nothing to deserve their beautiful surroundings and, and the plentiful resources in Eden. Right? Those, those were gifts from God given out of his love. And in the same way, God gave Israel the weekly Shabbat as a continual reminder that he is the source of all their blessings. They don't need to earn them through endless labor. Right? They can rest and trust that God will provide. And something interesting is added when the law is given to Israel a second time in Deuteronomy. The Sabbath command is repeated. Observe the Sabbath day to keep it holy as your Lord commanded you. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. And then the fact that the Sabbath is a, is a communal event, not just personal practice, is also repeated here. On it, you shall do no work, you or your son or your daughter or your male servant or your female servant or your ox or your donkey or any of your livestock or the sojourner who's within your gates, that your male servant and your female servant may rest as well as you. But then here in Deuteronomy, rather than repeating the fact that the seven day pattern is modeled after creation, God instead commands Israel to do something specific on Shabbat. You shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God brought you out from there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. So therefore, right, because the Israelites were to remember God rescuing them out of slavery in Egypt, that's why the Lord commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. Right? God gave them the Sabbath because we humans forget all too easily so the Israelites were commanded to repeatedly and continually remember that they were slaves in Egypt and that Yahweh rescued them. So it's not one overtakes the other. It should be. It's both. The fact that he pointed about, yes, this is because it points you to creation. Now he's adding in Deuteronomy because they've experienced it now for 40 years in the desert. Let me add this to it also. It also reminds you you were once a slave in Egypt. It's not a matter of disregarding one and taking on the other. No, not at all. Uh, and again, he just refuted himself. It is pointing back to creation. And we could stand here and because of the argument of silence, we could say, you know, it was given to Adam and mankind rejected it. Mankind just let it kind of go and didn't just didn't follow it. There's all kinds of disobedience going on from uh, the time they leave the garden all the way up to the time of him forging a nation. Uh, you know, where's a list of all these actual commands that, you know, were given? When we see Abraham, it just says that he obeyed all the commandments and instructions and statutes of Yahweh. It doesn't give a list of what those are. You know, could the Sabbath have been part of that list? We don't know. Could have been. He's already established the pattern in uh, Genesis that that's the pattern from which the the, the whole, uh, you know, creation operates. We don't know, right? But to flip around and just say, you know, oh, it never was given. I think that's just too huge of a stretch. It was a blessing to mankind is what Yeshua said. And my other thing I want to bring out uh, is every one, every, every set of verses he read, it said, and the sojourner within your gates and the sojourner <laughs> within your gates. That means it's a gur attached to Israel becoming part of the covenants. You're in the kingdom. You're part of the kingdom. Guess what? You got to do the kingdom laws. That's it. Uh, 
that that's really it. You beat me to that punch there, Tony. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but that's good. But he uh, he continues to uh, misconstrue, misunderstand um, that at Sinai there was a marriage. It was a marriage between two basic different sets of people groups and one God. The two different sets of people groups were what is commonly referred to as the children of Israel, but they are really because why? Because Jacob, the son of Isaac, the son of Abraham, had his name changed from Jacob, Yaakov, to Israel. Mm -hmm. So now all of his children and all of those who his children married, all of the maidservants, all of the concubines, all, all of all became part of the broad definition of the children of Israel. Now, so that's one people group. The other people group were the people from the nations. Let's go back to the Exodus account. When we're reading from Exodus 6 through 12 or 13 or so, what do we find? We find the plagues. We find that these plagues are being given in Egypt and the regular folk, the regular ham and eggers like you and I, we saw all of the plagues with our own eyes and we decided that, you know what? There's something going on with these people. We got nothing going on with our gods. I'm going with them. Right, right. <laughs> okay, so the two became one and through the historical Exodus account, Moses led them up out of Egypt. Once they left Egypt, they were an already physically and spiritually redeemed people. Physically redeemed because they were all slaves. Spiritually redeemed because Pharaoh was a god. Mm -hmm. Okay. They became immersed, baptized in the Sea of Reeds. And then... This already physically and spiritually redeemed combined group of people known as B'nai Yisrael, the children of Israel, became identified, baptized, we read it in 1 Corinthians, baptized into Moses, identified with Moses, and they got led to Sinai where this combined set of people then known after chapter 12 in Exodus, both groups are now forever known as the Israelites or the children of Israel. What happened at Sinai? Mm -hmm. To this combined group, they received the Torah. But there's more. Because in 19, there's the marriage. With every Jewish wedding, there's something given that's called the marriage contract. It's known formally as the ketubah. We're going to see the ketubah in chapter 20 of Exodus. And these are known, the summary is known, as, commonly known as the Ten Commandments. They're really the Ten Words. And it jumps from basically uh, verse 2 down to verse 17. The ketubah is the summary of the marriage. This is what you to do, so forth and so on. It's the heart and blood and soul of what? It's the heart and soul of the already physically and spiritually redeemed group of two different peoples that became together, now known in history as the Israelites or the children of Israel. And now, from chapter 21, 22, and 23, we have the terms of the covenant. These are the individual responsibilities of the groom 
and the bride. This is what's being set forth in 21, 22, and 23. Now, what do we have in 24? Now, he said, that's God said to Moses, come up to uh, the Lord, you and Aaron, uh, Nabob and Abihu, and the 70 of the elders of Israel, and worship from afar. And Moses alone came near the Lord, but they shall not come near, nor shall the people go up with him. Verse 3 in 24. So Moses came and told the people all the words of the Lord and all of the judgments. And all the people answered with one voice and said, all the words which the Lord has said we will do. Who are all of the people saying all of this. This is, again, the combined group of two peoples, the children of Israel coming out of Jacob and everybody attached to him, concubines, married into, etc., etc., etc. And those from the nations that became attached to them as Ruth attached herself to Naomi and became known again, and I'm repeating myself to make the point, became known historically after Exodus 12 as either the Israelites or the children of Israel. Those are the ones that said in verse 24, uh, rather chapter 24, verse 3, all the words of the Lord we shall do. And in verse four, now Moses wrote all the words of the Lord, and he rose up early in the morning and built an altar at the foot of the mountain and 12 pillars according to the 12 tribes of Israel. Then he sent young men of the children of Israel who offered burnt offerings and sacrifices, peace offerings and oxen to the Lord. And Moses took half of the blood, put it in basins, and half of the blood he sprinkled on the altar. Then, listen carefully now. Then he took the book of the covenant. And read it in the hearing of the people. And they said, once again, all that the Lord has said we will do and be obedient. And then in verse 8. Moses took the blood, sprinkled it on the people and said, this is the blood of the covenant, which the Lord has made with you, according to all of these words. What are all of these words? To summarize it, the ketubah, to elaborate it, everything that occurred in 21, 22 and 23, but for who? All of those that had just come into covenant with God himself through this ceremonial process that we see in all covenants that there is mm -hmm. an offer, there's an acceptance, there's the shedding of blood, and there's a covenant meal. We see it all here. Sadly, what dispensation theology does is they break things up into periods of time without the understanding that one covenant flows into another. A newer covenant does not replace anything that came before it, but that you have A in math. You have A plus B equals C. If you have a compound equation, mm -hmm. What are you going to do? You're going to eliminate A and B, and then you're not going to know what F and, F and G is? No, of course not. You continue to build on what was given before. That is the precise difference between a covenant and a testament, which is not biblical. A testament is a Greek legal document that defines the relationship between the two or the uh, the parties of the testament, but it has a specific beginning and it has a specific ending. A testament is not a covenant. However, 
in theological circles today, the terms become intermingled and wishwashed because predominantly in King James Version, I here we go again with my friend, the long since dead King Jimmy. <clears throat> look at the Hebrew, look at the word, look at the Greek word, do a word study for covenant. Look at, do a word study. Look at the Greek word for testament. You'll find it's the very same word. Now take that word and where do we find it first? We find it in the Septuagint. If we find a word in the Septuagint that finds itself into the Brit HaDashah, we must know automatically that there is a Hebrew word. What would be the Hebrew word that is translated the very same Greek as both Testament incorrectly and covenant? It's the word Brit. It, it means covenant. Now, here's my point. We talked about this earlier, about context, 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 context. I, I'm not challenging you, but I'm offering you to pick up the challenge to do the word study. Look at the context of every time you see testament. And if you can't do it yourself, <clears throat> we'll provide it to you because it's already been done. And then you can do it yourself. In many versions, you'll have it in English versions, you'll have it the right way. In KJV, which is the overwhelmingly one that is used predominantly, you'll find that in context, testament is used, but when you're looking at the context, it absolutely makes no sense. None whatsoever. A covenant, on the other hand, is and a, a it's a, a a testament is basically unilateral. A covenant, a biblical covenant, is bilateral between two parties entering into an ongoing relationship that will never end. It could be conditional or unconditional with all of the covenants, whether they are the seven standard covenants that we are taught throughout uh, the Bible or more importantly, the patriarchal covenants. Hashem, God, Adonai, is always going to do his part. Many times, sometimes, not all of the time, is a function, this co these covenants of man doing what they are supposed to do. That's why there's conditional and unconditional. If it's unconditional, we don't have to do a thing. It's going to happen. Because God said it. If it's conditional, the condition is upon us. We have to do something in order to partake of the covenant. But covenant builds upon what came before. It never ends. You can have additional terms of a covenant. So you can have A and then B. B builds upon A. And then C will build upon B, which already incorporates A. And then D will build upon C, already incorporating upon B, which already incorporated what was there in A. That's the difference between covenant and testament. Where do we get the word testament? Everybody knows last will and testament. There's no last will and testament in the Bible. There, there is basically a renewed covenant because what happens is that although many are taught there are new commands that Yeshua gave, they're all Torah-based. What is new 
about the new covenant is now the Torah, which some say is now no longer. It doesn't exist. It ended at Sinai when Moses broke the tablets. That's what our brother Rob uh, actually states in a different blog, in a different video on 2 Corinthians 3. Totally wrong. Absolutely totally wrong. Not it's an ongoing situation. And the difference is, now this is what I ask people who think that, that the Torah has ended where in uh, basically after the uh, the golden calf incident in Exodus 32. Okay. So if what you say is true, then what is written on your mind and on your heart, according to Hebrews 7 and 8? What is that? Help me out. I don't get it. It's the same Torah that you say is no good because it ended. If it's on my mind and in my heart, how can it be ended? Because it's written not on tablets of stone or a stony heart, but it's written on a fleshly heart because it's been circumcised by the spirit and guess what happens when anybody comes to biblical faith or faith in the biblical yeshua instantaneously the ruach circumcises our hearts and whether we want to accept it or not whether we acknowledge it or not whether we're going to teach against it or not the torah becomes written in our minds and upon our hearts. Simple. Why do you say that it's not for me? Because you don't understand covenant. You have a Western church mindset and you're devoid of biblical, not Hebrew roots, but you're devoid of biblical Jewish roots. I make a distinction because the Hebrew Roots Movement, HRM, is out there. When I came to faith some 29, almost a half years ago, there was no such thing as Hebrew Roots. It was all Jewish roots. But we got a bunch of wackos that are now in the Messianic Movement. And I, I in, in a... Uh, a short Torah commentary that I gave two weeks ago in synagogue. I was given the example, and this is non-political, that there's a common uh, term that's being bandied about. Uh, the acronym is RINO, Republican in name only. And then I said, well, there are some that are Tino, trusting in name only. There are some that are Fino, faithful in name only. And sadly, there are some who are Mino, Messianic in name only. And sadly, everybody, for them, there are always exceptions. There's always a remnant. The vast majority of people are in the days of the judges when everyone did what was right in the sight of their own eyes. And that's the mess that we have here today, compounded by the last, well, we can go back to uh, 325. With the Council of Nicaea and going all the way forward. But let's go back to the Reformation when, as you said, Tony, they all that they did, they only went back to attempt to reform the Catholic Church. And they didn't go further enough back. But all of those that were sitting at the Council of Nicaea, they were devoid of anything Jewish. There was not one sitting on that council that knew anything about Torah. Yeah. Error begets error. I also think it's important to, uh, for those of you watching to understand that the Sinai Covenant is not something sitting out there on an island by itself. 
it has the Abrahamic covenant with it. So the blessing that, that comes to Sinai, it needs to follow the pattern of the Abrahamic covenant, that he will forge a nation and through him, all the families of the earth will be blessed. That's not something that was on freeze frame and didn't happen until Yeshua came. That was always available. The nation was forged, bringing forth the blessing opportunity to the families of the earth. And that's why the mixed multitude showed up. They're like, we're here. This is part of the Abrahamic covenant. This, If, if you're forging a nation, that means I can be, I'm part of the families of the earth. The blessing comes to me too. I'm part of the inheritance. You know, I'm here. I mean, it's otherwise what you're saying, Solberg, is you're saying that from the time of Abraham until the time of Yeshua, you had to be a Jew to be saved. It was only an opportunity for a Jew. There was never an opportunity for a Gentile. These guys dwelling in the gates with Israel, they're not saved. They're not part of the covenant because they haven't taken on circumcision. So, hey. You know, they're uh, they're still not saved. They're not part of the covenant. Um, who are they? I mean, because you're telling me you have to be an Israelite to be saved because you want to say, I can't be part of the law of Moses unless I'm circumcised, meaning converting to be an Israelite. It's it's uh, this is what I mean for those of you listening. When you walk his argument through the argument that many others have, it can't stay consistent. As, as you just heard uh, Brother Mitch here walking you through certain definitions of words, certain things, it just it, it leaves it to the point where you can see that theory that Solberg has is not consistent with Scripture. It doesn't stay consistent. And that's what it is. It's a theory. It's not biblical truth. It's his brand of eisegesis, not exegesis. He's putting his own thoughts with his own theology into scripture and then pulling scripture out to line up with his preconceived notion, which is Aaron to begin with. No. Now, one other point when he refers to Deuteronomy uh, five. So always interesting because the, uh, the book of Deuteronomy in Hebrew uh, is Devarim, which means words. And we get uh, Deuteronomy from the Latin uh meaning uh you know second so that that's wrong but moses has three messages in the book of devarim and the first message which encompasses uh chapter five is historical he's going back and what happens in deuteronomy let's not forget the context or let's not forget the history that we now have the second generation everybody's died off Except for who? Moses. Joshua. And Caleb. The, these are the ones that are going to go forward. All Moses says, Hashem says to Moses, you can look, but you can't go. So Moses is giving a history lesson in his first message, his first sermon. And part of that is Let's not forget. Do not forget to remember not only where your parents and where us as a nation, as a people. Now, who is here in at Deuteronomy? It's still an ongoing larger group of combined, let's call it Jew and Gentile. Because more and more are becoming We'll use the terminology grafted in. Yeah. Man. He is the source of their salvation and their blessings, and they can rest and trust that he'll provide for them. And in that sense, the weekly Shabbat also looked forward to the time when God would restore creation to his original Edenic vision. Right? It was a weekly foretaste of how man will dwell with God in the last days, just like he did in the beginning, in the garden. And so the weekly Shabbat is linked to the seventh day of creation in that way as well. But again, the rest that God took on the last day of creation week is not the same thing as the command he gave to Israel thousands of years later at Mount Sinai. 
And that leads us to the second argument that our Hebrew Roots friends make about the Sabbath. Torahism points to the fact that keeping Shabbat is one of the Ten Commandments, which of course it is. The verses we just read about the Sabbath are from the giving of what we call the Ten Commandments, or in Hebrew, the Aseret Hadavarim, the Ten Words. And therefore, our Hebrew Roots friends claim, the Sabbath is eternally applicable. They see Sabbath keeping as a universal moral law, just like the other Nine Commandments. So by way of response to this second pillar, let me offer four ideas. First, we can't deny that the Sabbath is a bit of an anomaly in the Ten Commandments, right? Even ancient Jewish thinkers notice this. I mean, think about it. The other nine are specifically about issues that in and of themselves are moral in nature. Worshiping idols and murder and adultery and dishonoring your parents and coveting your neighbor's possessions. These are all objectively wrong for all people at all times. Right? And scripture shows God judging mankind for all those things. But the Sabbath doesn't fit that pattern. For one thing, prior to the law of Moses, keeping Shabbat wasn't required or commanded of anyone. So it hasn't applied at all times, like the other nine. And so I wonder where this list is that he has that God dealt with all the other nine, but not that one. He doesn't give a reference. He doesn't give uh chapter verse or anything where's this list he's talking about this is all something he just i'm assuming he just learned in bible college because uh this is seemingly just coming out of thin air the idea well, that the shabbat is not connected to your morality that's that's no that's nonsense well the uh the, the typical response to all of that as to why I don't have to uh, honor or keep Shabbat is because it's not indicated uh, as all of the other nine are in the Brit HaTashah. And therefore, uh, Yeshua is my rest and I have rest, which is missing the whole point because the rest that Yeshua gives is salvation, which is prototypical of what Shabbat is, which Rob did rightly refer to. When he's right, he's right. When he's wrong, is wrong, and just like me, um, as an example. So most Jewish people will side with Israel regardless. When Israel is right, she's right. When Israel is wrong, she's wrong. And I will stand up, raise my hand, and say that was wrong. Yeah. Just I like agree. for me. When, and this goes for all of us. Don't we know when we're doing something wrong? Almost all of the time. Here's the test. Will you acknowledge you're doing something wrong when a brother or sister comes to you and brings something to your attention that you weren't aware of? What are you going to do? This is basically what Rob is doing right here. He's just, no, poo-poo, poo-poo. There, there is so much in scripture that indicate that uh, Shabbat is for the believer, that it, it's kind of ridiculous, which really, in, in my mind, without being uh, condescending, it, it goes to a uh, lack of biblical literacy, which I find totally amazing uh, for someone who is a, theo a theologian, a professor, an apologist, but also at that he's a philosopher. So, you know, there we we can go Isaiah fifty six. Right. Isaiah 66, I mean, over and over. So I was just thinking if, of those two. Yeah. So if, if you say that Shabbat is not for me or I don't have to do it, well, okay, let's, let's, let's take that point. So you as a, Tony, I'll, I'll let you, I know where you're going to go. So you go with 56, I'll pick it up with 66. 
Amen. So in Isaiah 56, uh, basically one through seven, uh, he's actually telling the nation of Israel to preserve justice, do righteousness, because his salvation is about to come. All right. Preserving justice, preserving righteousness, that is in the Torah. That is, let's get our head in the game, basically. Let's get back to the basics, because my salvation is about to come, and you guys are so far from your covenant relationship. Because breaking Torah is breaking your covenant relationship. So get it. Let's get this right now. Okay. Because my salvation is coming. My righteousness, the righteousness of Yeshua is going to be revealed. And he says, blessed is the one who does this, the son of man who holds, who takes hold of it, who keeps from profaning Shabbat, the son of man. That's a general term for mankind. That's why Yeshua said Shabbat was given to mankind. Okay, or man, not man for Shabbat, meaning mankind. General term, not for a specific people, for a specific time, you know, no. So then he says, do not let a son of the foreigner who has joined himself to Yahweh say, Yahweh will surely exclude me from his people. Why is that? Well, the Shabbat is the sign of the covenant, right? It's the wedding ring. It's the sign. Don't exclude me. I want in, right? Yahweh, uh, nor let the eunuch say, behold, I am a dry tree. For thus says Yahweh to the eunuch who keep my Shabbatot, who choose what pleases me, uh, who chooses or chose what pleases me and hold fast to my covenant. You've got the eunuch holding fast to the covenant. I will give to them in my house and within my walls a memorial and a name better than sons and daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that will not be cut off. Also, the foreigner who joins themselves to Yahweh to minister to him and to love the name of Yahweh and to be his servants, all who keep from profaning Shabbat and hold fast to my covenant. They're holding fast to the wedding ring, holding fast to the covenant. It's very plain. Deuteronomy 29, the uh, foreigner was there taking the oath, taking, you know, joining into the covenant. It was perfectly acceptable. Just read verses 9 through 14. The Gentile was there too. It's always been offered to the Gentile. It was offered at Sinai, offered in Deuteronomy. Here it is in Isaiah. And then Brother Mitch in 66. Yeah. But even let, let's go back to the book of Jonah, which is uh, afterwards. So if yeah. Gentiles were not to be included in the covenant, then how come uh, all of those Assyrians uh, came to faith? And Jonah was pissed off, wasn't he? Yeah. <laughs> yep. Because repentance, seems, repentance is coming to 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 come to believe in, in uh, the father. It's coming to believe in the covenant. That's repentance. It's coming right, back. Yeah. Now, as an overall thought, uh, there would be very, very few that we would talk to uh, who would disagree that Isaiah 56 and also 66 uh, are not uh, part of uh, future, uh, not part of the messianic kingdom. Okay. Uh, because if, when you uh, dissect the book of Isaiah, it pretty much uh, divides itself into the Bible itself, because the first 39 chapters are almost always, with exceptions, of course, related to Tanakh. And then the last 27 chapters of Isaiah are all almost always related to Brit HaDashah. So having said that, in Isaiah 66, uh, verses uh, 22 and 23, so it says, For as the new heavens and the new earth, where do we hear those words? Uh, that's Yeshua. And in, in 5, 17 and 18, my Torah will not be abolished until there is a new heaven and there is a new earth. Didn't happen yet. So, which I will make remain before me, so shall your descendants and your name remain. 23. And it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another, that's month to month, and from one Shabbat to another, 
that's week to week, all, everybody, Jew and Gentile alike, in the kingdom that Yeshua comes, that's already here, but when he returns, all flesh shall come up to worship me, or worship before me, says the Lord. Now, Tony, you in uh, Isaiah 56, it mentions righteousness and the righteousness to come. And so if we go to 1 Corinthians 1.30, it says, but of him, you are in Messiah Yeshua. Who? Who is the who that we are in? Yeshua himself. So of Yeshua himself, Yeshua himself has become already at this point in time fulfilling the prophecy mentioned in 56 in, of Isaiah that he is the righteousness. He is the sanctification. He is the redemption. It's personal. It's physical. Mm -hmm. It's national. So there we have it, folks. There's uh, the more you get into scripture, the more that you see the folly of the attempted refute. But the refute comes not from exegesis. The refute comes from eisegesis with an already predetermined theology that now I really have to find scripture and I'm going to twist it and turn it and indicate it that it means something other than it doesn't. That's cherry picking, my friends. Yeah. Rather than coming from dispensation as your foundation, dispensationalism, it would be nice to come from the foundation of covenants. When you come from the foundation of covenants and you understand that word, as Brother Mitch explained, you won't worry about dispensation because it's one constant flow of a relationship with a people a relationship that is building progressive revelation of the trueness of the will of the father. It just flows together. So. Yep. One of the big damage of dispensationalism, it gives you the, the false foundation to start with. You, you now are not starting first. You started with replacement theology as your foundation. That's how uh, the Catholic church and so many other uh, you know, denominations and broke off denominations started from, then you move to dispensationalism. You're still not at the right foundation yet. You got to go back to covenants. Mm -hmm. And so many other ills from dispensation theology. Amen, everyone. Well, I think we're going to stop here for today. Uh, I think we've given you a whole lot to chew on. And of course, as we would always say, test what we are saying. Uh, we don't mind the pushback. Uh, leave some comments, hit the like button, spread the video around. Uh, if you want to hit the subscribe button there on the right-hand side to see the rest of the videos, the other uh, 50 of them that we've done there, it's in the playlist that I have set up, plus many other videos about Yeshua, the Torah, uh, many other topics about the Moedim and so forth. So, yeah, uh, we would encourage you to go ahead. If you find this very valuable uh, information, please spread it around. Uh, we are happy to answer questions. Uh, there will be an email in the description box if people want to email us questions or email us information. Hey, we'll take a look at it. That's that's great. That's fine. Any uh, and, final uh, final words, brother? Well, yeah. what I'll do, Tony, is I'll send you the uh, that word study so that you can put up as well. Sure. Uh, covenant and Testament, and then people can look for themselves. Amen. I'll put it. Uh, it. Yeah, absolutely. Amen. Well, everyone, we hope you guys have a blessed week. We hope to be back next week and uh, we will keep uh, pushing forward here as we are heading towards Hanukkah. That'll be something maybe we'll touch on in the weeks here to come. It is a perfect description of preparing ourselves for the second coming of Yeshua. Not only that, but most importantly, it shows the faithfulness to Yahweh, to his covenants, to his people and to his promises. That is huge for Hanukkah. 
That's the big uh, foundational understanding that I get from it. The faithfulness of Yahweh to his people, to his promises. So one, one last thought about Hanukkah, since you mentioned it. So we would all agree that uh, as believers in the biblical Yeshua, we are, in fact, the temple of God. Amen. So Hanukkah, although the word means dedication, let's go back historically and understand that the temple during the historical Hanukkah account was not dedicated. It was rededicated. Right. What better time of year to rededicate our own personal temple of God than Hanukkah itself? Amen. But let's also remember that without the victory of the Maccabees ragtag army over the most powerful army of the world in the day, led by Antiochus IV, there would not have been any Torah, any Shabbat, any circumcision. None of these arguments would uh, be around today because there would not have been any more Jewish people. And therefore, the scripture that says salvation is of the Jews would not be true because that little baby in the manger that so many in the Western church celebrate his birthday on the wrong day. That's a whole nother kettle of fish, but uh, I'm not getting into a paganism thing of Christmas. Okay. That, that's not where I'm going. My point is that there is nothing more Jewish about Christmas than Hanukkah in its proper context. Mm -hmm. No Hanukkah, no Yeshua, no Yeshua, no salvation, no salvation, no Christmas, no Christmas, everybody, Jew and Gentile, were all lost in sauce. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Plain and simple. <laughs> Amen. And with that, we will say shalom, everyone, and we hope to uh, see you next week. Amen. Amen.